My name is Grégoire Courtin. I'm a neuroscientist and I work with spinal cord injury. But today, I not only would like to tell you the scientific story, but also the human journey that led my team to develop an intervention that restores voluntary control of locomotion after a paralyzing lesion of the spinal cord. And the journey starts with a dramatic consequence of a spinal cord injury for affected individual, who lives shatters in the matter of a handful of seconds. And Christopher Reeve, the man of steel, better than anyone, has incarnated the devastating consequence of such injuries. And you know, Christopher believed in research. He believed that recovery was possible. And he loved to talk with scientists. I mean, I remember sitting in a meeting all day, and at the end of the day, he talked to us, and he said, you know, you scientists, tomorrow, when you leave the laboratory, I want you to stop by the rehab center and to look at the people who are fighting to take a step, struggling to maintain their trunk. And when you go home, you will think of what you can change tomorrow in your laboratory to make their life better. And you know what he says just stuck to me, you know, to the point that I can say that Christopher and my work with the foundation has altered the course of my life. But let's continue the journey with the basics. Why does a severe lesion of the spinal cord lead to paralysis? In this scheme, the spinal cord is cut in two sections. This means that all the information from the brain are interrupted. The spinal cord below the injury is in a dormant state. And both human and rat, after such lesion, remain permanently paralyzed. So how should we proceed in order to restore function? Well, the more widely accepted principle consists of applying factors that will promote the growth of the severed fibers to their original target. And you know, this seems extraordinarily complicated to me. I mean, imagine not only the fibers have to grow, but they have to communicate with some of the millions of neurons below the injury in a functional manner. So with my colleague, we thought to shift the paradigm and to take advantage of the neuronal network below the injury. We know they can coordinate locomotion, but they are dormant. And you know, at the time, I had just arrived in Los Angeles after finishing my PhD in France, where professors you know, don't necessarily promote independent thinking. So you know, I have this idea, but you know, I don't know, can I like, put it forward? But you know, I just like, muster up my courage, I push the door of my wonderful mentor, Reggie Edgerton, you know, and I expose my idea, enthusiast, and he look at me, and then he's like, why don't you try? <laughs> you know, and this was a turning moment in my career, when I realized that a great leader believed in young people and their idea. And this was the idea. I'm going to use a simple metaphor to explain to you. Imagine that the locomotive system is a car. The spinal cord is the engine, but it's turned off. How do we proceed to reactivate this system? First, you need to provide the fuel. Second, you need to press the accelerator pedal. And finally, you have to steer the car. And my idea was to mimic this input, to provide the spinal cord with the kind of information that the brain would deliver naturally in order to walk. And this is how we proceed. Ten years of research summarized rapidly you know, to provide the fuel, we design a pharmacological cocktails that optimally prepare the neuron to fire. And to mimic the push on the pedal, we apply electrical stimulation on the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord. And together, this stimulation is what I call an electrochemical neuroprosthesis, which can transform the dormant network in the spinal cord to a highly functional state. And this is what you are going to observe. The right ear, you see, is completely paralyzed. Five minutes later, with the stimulation, the animal can stand. As soon as the train will start moving, the spinal cord produces coordinated locomotion. This is involuntary, but not stereotypical, because if you increase the speed of the treadmill belt, immediately the spinal cord is capable of changing the gait. And no, the rat is actually sprinting on the treadmill belt until we stop, and the animal will just stand. You know? And this observation really compelled me to call this neuronal network the spinal brain. You know, we need to recognize a remarkable capacity to use the sensory information as a source of control for locomotion. 
and to take decisions as to how to activate the muscle in order to produce you know, a very complicated movement without any input from the brain. And you know, we play a lot with my friend in Los Angeles, understanding this locomotion, but I was very frustrated. I mean, this is completely involuntary. You know, clearly, the steering system was missing. And it became pretty obvious to me that we had to move away from the treadmill setting and develop a robot that would allow us to train the rat on the natural conditions, you know, of the ground. So we developed this robot, you know, fancy technology. There is a suspension system at the extremity of which the rat is attached. And the idea of this robot is that it provides support against the direction of gravity, as well as in the lateral directions, but does not facilitate locomotion in the forward direction. So let me summarize. The animal suffers a paralyzing lesion. We enable highly functional state with the electrochemical neuroprosthesis. The robot provides a safe environment for the rat to try to engage the hind limb. And then, to motivate the animal, we use the more powerful pharmacology of Switzerland, the fine chocolate. <laughs> and you know, when the robot arrived in the laboratory, we were all so excited, you know, will the animal be capable of walking over ground? And this is what we observed. Very, very frustrating. The animal was incapable of initiating and sustaining locomotion. Whereas the same rat, you no, know, five minutes before, would walk superbly on the treadmill. You know, I'm a stubborn person. So I told Rubia, who is a therapist here on this video, you, know, you have to motivate the animal. Do anything for them to activate the hind limb. You use the chocolate, but also the vocal stimulation. You know, and actually, you can hear this on the video, and Rubia thinks that the rat understands her. I don't know if it's true, but you know, after a few additional weeks of training, the rat could stand quietly, and whenever she decided, she initiated full weight bearing locomotion to sprint toward the reward. You know, it was really surprising. I was absolutely not expecting such results. So I challenged Rubia, I said, what can they do? What are the limits of this animal? Train them in more complicated locomotive tasks. And Rubia, she picked up the challenge. And after a few additional weeks of training, a rat with a paralyzing lesion was capable of basically sprinting along a staircase. And this recovery you know, is really unprecedented. This is the very first time that we observe, after a paralyzing lesion of the spinal cord, the recovery of not only voluntary, but even adaptive control of the high limbs. And you know, I was really very enthusiastic. I love this result. I go to a conference. I present this data to my colleague. They did not like it. <laughs> you know, this, the approach was so different. Say, like, oh, is it possible? What are the mechanisms? This work is completely involuntary. The spinal cord controls it. And in a way, they are right, you know, because this study really challenges the idea of voluntary and involuntary motor control. No, as I am walking now, no, the spinal cord takes care of most of the underlying operation so that my brain is free to talk to you. Even the upper limb. You know, I'm French, so I use my hand too much when I talk. That's what my mother says, at least. And, uh, you know, this is voluntary, involuntary? I don't know. But you know, this resistance of the establishment to accept this result really created a lot of problems, you know, first with my institution, well, even in my laboratory, because people were afraid. You know, say, we are taking too much risk. But I told them, do you believe in this data? And they say, yes, yes. OK, so let's take this opportunity, these critiques, to investigate even deeper the underlying mechanism and prove our point. You know, and after two additional uh, years of very hard work, this is what we observe we found that this active training on the highly functional state with the willpower of the rat promoted an extensive reorganization of the central nervous system, by which the brain established new connections, relays that bypass the injury and restore supraspinal control over the neuron below the injury. And what you see in this picture here is you no know, red fibers that are coming from the brain, the blue neuron project below the injury, and what it essentially tells you is that the brain is reconnected with the locomotor network. And this plasticity, we not only observe it at the level of the injury, but throughout the central nervous system, including in the brainstem, where we found a 300% increase 
in the density of the projection from the motor cortex. You know, this may be the more extensive reorganization of the neuronal projection observed to date after a lesion of the central nervous system. And you know, I'm going to the next conference and I show this data to my colleague, but they were still disappointed. They were arguing that the motor cortex of the rat is not involved in controlling locomotion. You know, and I remember going home in the airplane, looking through uh, the window, and I'm upset. <laughs> you know, and the next day I go to the lab and I told my people, we have to record the neuron in the brain. And remember, I mean, this is a really complicated task. Imagine the rat suffered a very severe lesion. We gained the capacity to walk with intense training, and then has to undergo an additional surgical procedure in order to position microwire into the cortex in the vicinity of this yellow neuron that projects to the lesion area. And then, while you stimulate the spinal cord electrically, there is a big robot hovering over the head of the animal, you have to record microvolts in order to obtain this wave. They are the signature of the neuron. And uh, now we can translate this wave into audio, and what you will hear now is the neuron in the motor cortex of a rat that fires when the animal walks voluntarily with his own will. I can tell you, when you were, we obtained this data the very first time, it was a very special moment in the laboratory. Now I have all my like, wonderful team all around me, and like, we were all observing, listening to this uh, brain symphony you know, with a very large smile, because we were thinking, if we validated our claims. You know? And uh, I mean, this is not the end of the journey. I mean, you are all wondering, what is the potential therapeutic impact of this kind of intervention for human with spinal cord injury. And the truth is that we don't know. But I would like first to let David, who is potentially our first patient enrolled in the plain clinical trial, to provide you with his own perspective on this research. I had an accident, now it's uh, on the 8th of November, it will be one year ago. In my sports teacher education, we went to a center to practice acrobatics and there I made somersaults. And then um, with uh, two or three rotations, and uh, once I landed, yeah, on my head somehow. And after that, I came here. It's difficult to say how it will be with humans. Maybe it will be better, maybe it will be worse. I mean, but I think you gotta try to do the impossible to make the possible possible. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's important to have a dream, but if it's realistic or not, I'm not sure. But I think if you don't try, you won't find out. So let's hope and go for it. And I really would like to emphasize, you know, this is not a cure for spinal cord injury. But this may be a, an important piece of this complicated puzzle, and we may have gotten one step closer. And what I hope I've been able to convince you of during my talk is that you know, by swimming upstream, by thinking out of the box, and pursuing your idea with perseverance, you can achieve an outcome that was thought previously to be impossible. And I hope that with this journey, we have inspired new thinking to restore motor function after spinal cord injury. Thank you.
I have a question. I mean, isn't it kind of strange to make rats walk on their two feet? Yeah, you are right to point this out, Darcy. Uh, so it's not the physiological posture, clearly, for a rat to walk on two legs. But there is a very important scientific reason to test the animal on two legs. You know, because the forelimb are intact, the animal, if we would put him on all four, would be able to move forward with his forelimb, and basically the hind limb would just follow, just like on the treadmill. And this gait can be completely involuntary. So the only possibility to test whether the brain can actually engage the hind limb in order to walk voluntarily is to position the rat in this, okay, surprisingly uh, bipedal posture, but very useful heuristically. You know, and it's also like pretty nice, so it makes a nice picture, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Grégoire. You're welcome.